And now chapter 26, the Ayla Gita. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Having achieved this human form of life, which affords one the opportunity to realize me, and being situated in my devotional service, one can achieve me the reservoir of all pleasure and the supreme soul of all existence residing within the heart of every living being. A person fixed in transcendental knowledge is freed from conditioned life by giving up his false identification with the products of the material modes of nature. Seeing these products as simply illusion, he avoids entanglement with the modes of nature, although constantly among them. Because the modes of nature and their products are simply not real, he does not accept them. One should never associate with materialists, those dedicated to gratifying their genitals and bellies. By following them, one falls into the deepest pit of darkness, just like a blind man who follows another blind man. The following song was sung by the famous emperor Pururabha. When deprived of his wife Urvashi, he was at first bewildered. But by controlling his lamentation, he began to feel detachment. When she was in the process of leaving him, even though he was naked, he ran after her just like a madman and called out in great distress, Oh, my wife! Oh, terrible lady! Please stop! Although for many years Pururava had enjoyed sex pleasure in the evening hours, still he was not satisfied by such insignificant enjoyment. His mind was so attracted to Urbashi that he did not notice how the nights were coming and going. King Ayla said, Alas, just see the extent of my delusion. This goddess was embracing me and held my neck in her grip. My heart was so polluted by lust that I had no idea how my life was passing. <laughs> I was so cheated by that lady that I did not even see the rising or setting of the sun. <laughs> Alas, for so many years I passed my days in vain. Alas, although I am supposed to be a mighty emperor, the crown jewel of all kings on this earth, just see how my bewilderment has rendered me a toy animal in the hands of women. Although I was a powerful lord with great opulence, that woman gave me up as if I were no more than an insignificant blade of grass. And still, naked and without shame, I followed her, crying to her like a madman. Where are my so-called great influence, power and sovereignty? Just like an ass being kicked in the face by his she-ass, I ran after that woman who had already given me up. What is the use of a big education, or the practice of austerities and renunciation? And what is the use of studying religious scriptures, of living in solitude and silence, if after all of that, one's mind is stolen by a woman? To hell with me! I am such a fool that I didn't even know it was good for me, although I arrogantly thought I was highly intelligent. Although I achieved the exalted position of a lord, I allowed myself to be conquered by women, as if I were a bullock or a jackass. Even after I had served the so-called nectar of the lips of Urvashi for many years, my lusty desires kept rising again and again within my heart and were never satisfied, just as one can never placate a fire 
by pouring oblations of ghee into the flames. Who but the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who lies beyond material perception and is the Lord of self-satisfied sages, can possibly save my consciousness, which has been stolen by a prostitute. Because I allowed my intelligence to become dull, and because I failed to control my senses, the great confusion in my mind did not go away, even though Urbashi herself gave me wise counsel with well-spoken words. <laughs> How can I blame her for my trouble when I myself am ignorant of my real spiritual nature? I did not control my senses, and so I am like a person who mistakenly sees a harmless rope as a snake. What is this polluted body anyway? so filthy and full of bad odors. I was attracted by the fragrance and beauty of a woman's body, but what are those so-called attractive features? They are simply a false covering created by illusion. One can never decide whose property the body actually is. Does it belong to one's parents who have given birth to it? To one's wife? who gives it pleasure, or to one's employer who orders the body around? Is it the property of the funeral fire or of the dogs and jackals who may ultimately devour it? Is it the property of the indwelling soul who partakes in its happiness and distress? Or does the body belong to intimate friends who encourage and help it? Although a man never definitely ascertains the proprietor of the body, he becomes most attached to it. The material body is a polluted material form heading toward a lowly destination. Yet when a man stares at the face of a woman, he thinks, Ah, what a good-looking lady! What a charming nose she's got! And see her beautiful smile! What difference is there between ordinary worms and persons who try to enjoy this material body composed of skin, flesh, blood, muscle, fat, marrow, bone, stool, urine, and pus. Yet even one who theoretically understands the actual nature of the body should never associate with women or with men attached to women. After all, the contact of the senses with their objects inevitably agitates the mind because the mind is not disturbed by that which is neither seen nor heard, the mind of a person who restricts the material senses will automatically be checked in its material activities and become pacified. Therefore, one should never let his senses associate freely with women or with men attached to women. Even those who are highly learned cannot trust the six enemies of the mind, what to speak then of foolish persons like me? Having thus chanted this song, Maharaj Pururava, eminent among the demigods and human beings, gave up the position he had achieved in the planet of Urvashi. His illusion cleansed away by transcendental knowledge, he understood me to be the supreme soul within his heart, and so at last achieved peace. An intelligent person should therefore reject all bad association, and instead take up the association of saintly devotees, whose words cut off the excessive attachment of one's mind. My devotees fix their minds on me, and do not depend upon anything material. They are always peaceful, endowed with equal vision, and free from possessiveness, false ego, duality, and greed. O greatly fortunate Uddhava, in the association of such saintly devotees, there is constant discussion of me, and those partaking in this chanting and hearing of my glories are certainly purified of all sins. Whoever hears, chants, and respectfully takes to heart these topics about me, becomes faithfully dedicated to me, and thus achieves my devotional service. 
what more remains to be accomplished for the perfect devotee after achieving devotional service unto me, the supreme absolute truth, whose qualities are innumerable and who am the embodiment of all ecstatic experience. Just as cold, fear and darkness are eradicated for one who has approached the sacrificial fire, so dullness, fear and ignorance are destroyed for one engaged in serving the devotees of the Lord. The devotees of the Lord, peacefully fixed in absolute knowledge, are the ultimate shelter for those who are repeatedly rising and falling within the fearful ocean of material life. Such devotees are just like a strong boat that comes to rescue persons who are at the point of drowning. Just as food is the life of all creatures, just as I am the ultimate shelter for the distressed, and just as religion is the wealth of those who are passing away from this world, so my devotees are the only refuge of persons fearful of falling into a miserable condition of life. My devotees bestow divine eyes, whereas the sun allows only external sight, and that only when it is risen in the sky. My devotees are one's real worshipable deities and real family. They are one's own self, and ultimately they are non-different from me. Thus losing his desire to be on the same planet as Urvashi, Maharaj Pururava began to wander the earth free of all material association and completely satisfied within the self. Thus ends the 26th chapter of the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled the Isla Gita.